Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Woodbury Church of the Brethren. I'm so glad that you guys were able to make it out to worship with us this morning. Um, we do have quite a few announcements. The uh, youth will continue to meet on Sunday nights from 6 to 7 in what used to be the young adult room. Uh, this Tuesday night, we will again be having the YouTube small group from 6.15 to 7.15. And on Wednesday night from 6.30 to 7.30 will be the painting small group. Um, and uh, there were a lot of adults that showed a lot of interest in that as well. I don't think you guys have any plans for an adult painting night yet, but uh, youth, 6th grade, 12th grade, invited to come out for that. Uh, Lydia Barton is collecting blankets for shelters through her project Wraps of Love. You can leave a new blanket near the mailboxes or monetary donations in Jason Barton's mailbox. Um, the Sunday School Christmas Outreach this year is donating items for the village at Morrison's Cove to fill residents' Christmas bags. Now you can find the list of items we are collecting for those bags inside your bulletin. It's a pretty detailed list, so I'm not going to bore you all reading that whole list down. There's also a typo in the bulletin. Uh, Meredith and Chris Rhodes' new address is 314 Poplar Street, not 324 Poplar Street. Did I get that right? 314, not 320? Okay. 314 Poplar Street. Um, finally, this Sunday we are beginning a week-long focus on revival in the church. This is in lieu of our traditional fall revival services. And we think it's very important given all that's going on in our world. Uh, we hope each one of you will be a part of that. Uh, the basis for this focus is a study written by Reverend Harold Martin and published by Bible Helps. The study is titled Steps to Revival in the Church. Uh, we have divided the introduction in six steps into seven daily devotions. In addition to Harold Martin's study, we have added several additional scripture references and two or three questions for reflection for each of the six steps. Each day's devotions can easily be completed in 15 or 20 minutes, unless you want to dig deeper into the scriptures. There's also a daily video from T, which will add to your enjoyment of the study and appeal to your children as well. Um, the video for T does not start until Monday. So the introduction for this is on our website starting today, Sunday, and then T's videos will start Monday. They're all on the website. You go to our website, www. OneFreeCOB.org, and on the top bar you can see Revival written up there. You click on that, and you'll have a button for each day, as well as T's video. Along with T's videos are questions for parents and children uh, to kind of talk about what happened in the video and kind of be on the same page along with the whole Revival um, topic for that day. Um, so everything is available on the website. If you are not um, tech savvy enough to figure that out. There are hard copies available of the adult version of the revival stuff. It's all basically just um, devotion and a couple questions, like I said. Tease videos, not available by hard copy. You have to figure out the internet. If you really want to and can't figure that out, give me a call and I can kind of help walk you through that again. Um, Alright, so I think that was Okay, we got through that. So our preparation thought this morning is from Psalm 85, 6 through 7. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. We pray with me. God, we just uh, come before you, and everybody that's come in this morning, I'm sure, has different thoughts and concerns and feelings and uh, just a tumble of just emotions right now, God, and I just pray that uh, we will be able to lay all those aside as we come. And God, I pray that you would that you would open the heavens, you would come down, and you would meet with us today, God, that you would be in our presence. And God, I pray that the worship we bring in this morning um, would bring you glory, that you'd be lifted up, and that we would all be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I invite you to meditate on the words and music of Revive Us Again.
It is now time for special music. As they're pulling it up, I want to um, invite you guys to check out um, the service from last week on YouTube. Ella Gable was able to bring special music to the second service that you guys just sat on, but that is a part of the video on YouTube. Um, so now I invite you to enjoy this special music. Trust in 
water, I needed you to know When you don't climb the waters, I wish I could walk through When you don't give me answers, as I cry out to you I won't trust, I won't trust, I won't trust in you Truth is you know what tomorrow brings This not a day ahead you have not seen So it updates me my life and breath I want what you want Lord and nothing less When you don't move the mountains I'm needing you to move When you don't climb the waters I wish I could walk through When you don't give me answers That's the I won't trust, I won't trust, I won't trust in you. I won't trust in you. You are my strength and comfort, you are my steady hand, you are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher, your plans are always good. There's not a place where I go, you've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I needing you to move. When you don't find the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I won't trust, I won't trust, I won't trust in you. I won't trust in you. I won't trust in you. Trust in you. See you there.
pray that you would speak to us this morning, Heavenly Father. Remind us of your power and your presence and the things that you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> This morning I want to share with you from this passage on the idea of revival. In, in lieu of a series of revival services this year, we're, we're offering a revival emphasis for the week to come, and we hope you'll take advantage of that. Whether you do it as a, as a couple or, or within your family or just do it on your own, uh, I think it's an important thing for the time that we're in. I, I think there's a lot to be gained by this. There are numerous reasons why this is especially fitting for us right now. First of all, obviously, we have just come through one of the most divisive elections in our nation's history. And we're seeing lawsuits and, and allegations of, of voter fraud, many other accusations and challenges being leveled that only add to the contentiousness and the division. As Christians, we need to recognize that God is still in charge, that our faith and our hope must be in Him alone. This is a time when we need to be praying earnestly for our nation and, and for whichever leaders emerge out of all of this. This is a time when we need to be repenting of our own failures, get our priorities back in order, and refocus our time and efforts on the kingdom of God. We, you and I, Woodbury Church of the Brethren, the church in America, and really all of America, needs to be revived. There are some who are suggesting that it's actually too late, that we need to simply be preparing believers for God's judgment to come. I hope that's not the case. I thought this morning about introducing the topics that are going to be discussed in our week-long series of, of revival, but I, I decided on a different course. I, I want to look this morning at this great Old Testament revival that took place on Mount Carmel when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal. Most of the encounter uh, was in the scripture that, that Dave just read. I, and I don't think it's at all at odds with the focus of what we're going to be looking at this week. But well, why prelude to revival? A prelude is something that serves as an introduction to the main event. Something that helps us to prepare for something greater. And my prayer is that God will speak to us just such a message, message this morning. E even the, step, even the, the study that we're going to follow, steps to revival in the church, it is more of a prelude. Steps of preparation so that revival will follow. The word revive is based on the Latin word vivere. The prefix re means again, and, and vivere means to live. So the word translated literally is again to live. Again to live. One of the dictionary definitions of revival is bring, uh, bringing up or coming back to life or consciousness. Another definition is a stirring of religious faith among those who have been indifferent, usually by fervent evangelistic preaching at a public meeting. That's what we tend to think of within the church as revival. But the word implies that there is something that was once very much alive, that is now dead, or at least not nearly alive as it once was, and it needs to be brought back to life. We need to ask, our, ask ourselves, what is there in my life that needs to be, a, a, that used to be alive and vibrant and exciting, and now it's dead and dry, perhaps even non existent? What needs to be revived? How is your devotional life? Do you find joy in, in spending time alone with God in, in prayer, in, in reading the Word, in, in meditating on His truths? Are you still excited about serving Him? Discovering His will for your life. Following where He leads. Are you still delighted at the thought of being part of the church, the body of Christ? Is your relationship with Him alive and vibrant? Does it still bring joy and peace and hope? Or have other things and, and other activities crowded all that out? If so, you're in serious need of revival. 
Let's look a little closer at the people of Elijah's day who were involved in this revival. I have a tendency to think as of these men and women as people who had completely rejected Jehovah God, who had totally sold out to Baal worship. But that's not the case. The fact is, they were trying to have it both ways. They couldn't make up their minds whether Jehovah was God or Baal was God. So, so they figured they covered themselves by worshiping both. There is no place in our walk of faith for that. We can't serve God in the world. We can't serve God in money. We can't serve God in career. We can't serve God in pleasure. It doesn't work that way. I'm not saying we can't have money or, or careers. I'm not saying we can't have fun and enjoy life. But we can only have one master, one controlling force in our lives. Ezekiel records that the people would go to the temple of Molech, which is one of the gods under the plural title of Baal, and literally sacrifice their children in the fire. On the same day, they would go into the temple and at least go through the motions of worshiping God. God called their worship desecration. We can't party like the world on Saturday night and expect God to pour out His Spirit on us on Sunday morning. We can't indulge in the pleasures of the world and expect the, the peace and joy and fulfillment that only God can give. We can't live in open rebellion to God's Word and expect His blessings in our lives. Just like the people in Elijah's day, we need to decide who we're going to follow and serve. What is revival? Revival is not something that just happens. We can't just sit, away, sit around waiting for revival to mysteriously come upon us. That certainly isn't how it happened in this passage. In fact, it was a scheduled event. Elijah went to King Ahab and said, Schedule a meeting of, of all the people of Israel up on Mount Carmel. You bring along your, your 450 prophets of Baal and, and 400 prophets of Asherah. I'll bring God. We'll see who's in charge. And we'll settle this confusion. I believe that revival will only come when it has been planned for and prepared for, when it was, has been longed for and, and prayed for, when it has become a priority in the hearts and lives of God's people, when we're ready to let God move in us to be part of that process, then we may see revival. It doesn't just happen. Revival is a confrontation. What an incredible confrontation this was up on Mount Carmel. It was the, the king and queen and all these false prophets. It was a bunch of gods who didn't exist against Elijah and the one true God in full view of all the nation of Israel. Elijah let set the scene. We'll both prepare bulls and, and put them on the altar. You call on your gods, I'll call on the Lord. And we'll see which one answers with fire. You can go first. Revival is not something you just sort of slide into. It's a confrontation. One that be, can be rather overwhelming if we're just counting heads of, of believers and non-believers. But we have the one true God with us. The world has nothing. However, we need to be willing to confront some things. Starting in our own hearts and lives. There's a lot of spiritual carelessness. There's a lot of apathy. There's a lot of disunity. There's a lot of unconfessed, unrepented of sins in our lives and in our churches. And we need to start there. Maybe after we get our own hearts and lives in good order. When we have freed ourselves up to truly follow the Lord, we can begin to confront the evil that's out there in the world. Revival is confrontation. Revival will also face frantic opposition. The prophets of Baal called on their gods all morning. It, it didn't go well for them. Nothing was happening. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Hey, you know, maybe you're not yelling loud enough. Maybe he's, he's deep in thought or, or busy or traveling. Maybe he changed his cell phone number and forgot to tell you. Maybe he's taking his morning nap and he's a, a deep sleeper. 
When they saw they were in danger of losing this confrontation, they really got frantic. They yelled louder and louder. They cut themselves with swords and spears and, and let the blood flow. They prophesied frantically right, right through the afternoon up to the time of the evening worship. But nothing happened. Satan is a loser. God has defeated him. Christ has defeated him once and for all. But Satan can still win the battle for individual lives if we let him. There is no way that Satan is going to sit idly by and let revival come to a nation, a church, or even an individual life without doing all that he can to oppose it. He has many character defects, but unfortunately, apathy isn't one of them. One way that Satan keeps us out of the revival process is through our busy schedules. You may have already looked at your schedule for the week ahead and, and said, I just don't have time to be in, involved with any of that. I'm, I'm way too busy. I can't, I can't fit that thing into my schedule. But if you're in that boat, I want you to consider whether that schedule is really legitimate. Or whether it's simply Satan's way of keeping you from experiencing revival. Are you serving God or are you serving your schedule? There are many other ways that Satan can oppose us in revival. If you're truly seeking revival, expect opposition. To prepare for revival, we need to rebuild altars. Before Elijah prepared the bull for sacrifice, he rebuilt the altar, which was in ruins. It was in ruins because the people were negligent and careless. It was in ruins because they weren't serving God wholeheartedly. The altar was a place of sacrifice and devotion. It was a place of atoning for one's sins. It was a place of worship. If we're going to see revival, we need to rebuild some altars. We need to rebuild the altar of sacrifice and devotion. What are you willing to give up to make devotion possible? What, what sacrifices are you willing to make? How devoted are you to the cause of Christ? He needs everything we've got. He needs the best that we can possibly give. Now as never before, there is a need for Christians who will wholeheartedly pour themselves out in seeking the kingdom of God. The kingdom is not the highest priority on your to-do list. If there's anything else that takes precedence over that, we cannot expect to see revival. We need to rebuild the altar of sacrifice. We need to rebuild the altar of confession and repentance. You know, thank God we don't, we're not required anymore to sacrifice animals on an altar to pay for our sins. But we are told to confess and to repent. And we've got a lot of confessing to do. We need to confess that we've often showed judgment instead of mercy. We need to, to confess that often we have seen those outside of God's will as the enemy rather than sheep who need to be fed. We need to confess that we have often watched those around us go merrily on their way to eternal separation from God without lifting our hands to do anything to stop them. We need to confess that when the world looks at us, only rarely do they really see a good picture of the Jesus Christ that we claim to represent. And we could go on and on. We need to confess and we need to repent. We need to receive God's cleansing and move out in a right relationship with Him. We need to rebuild the altar of confession and repentance. We need to rebuild the altar of God-honoring worship. God seeks those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Just showing up for church is not enough. Just going through the motions isn't enough. Just performing the rituals isn't enough. Worship isn't about what makes me feel good or, or what 
what makes the people who, who enter our church, but church building feel good either. It's about praising and honoring and lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. It's, what about, it's, it's about what is pleasing to Him. In an article in World Magazine, William Smith lamented the fact that many churches have focused their services around what appeals to their target audience, their, their customers. And they're no longer concerned about what pleases God. He concludes the article with these words. Unfortunately, when the Father seeks the worship which rightfully belongs to Him, He has fewer and fewer places to look. And those who are seeking Him are less and less likely to find Him among us. If we focus on pleasing God, not, not ourselves or our target market, Maybe God will show up and actually fill our worship service with His presence. Let's rebuild the altar of worship. In this passage, we also see what it takes to see the power of God in revival. What it takes to see the power of God in revival. We need to pray earnestly for revival. Elijah's prayer is recorded in verses 36 and 37. O oh Lord God of Jacob, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. And I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O oh Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and you are turning their hearts back again. I have to believe this wasn't the first time that Elijah had raised this concern to the Lord. He had spent more than two years preparing for this day. And I have to believe a great many prayers were offered up to bring this great day of revival about. And I believe it will take a great deal of prayer for revival to come to our lives, to our church, and to our nation. Elijah's prayer is a model prayer for revival. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you are turning your hearts back, their hearts back again. We lift up many concerns to God. Personal concerns. Concerns for, for health and, and safety of others. Concerns for our children and so on. But let's not forget to pray for the revival that we so desperately need. To bring about revival, we need fire from heaven. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. Regardless of all that led up to this point, the, the confrontation, the rebuilding of the altar, the prayer, if God had not sent fire from heaven, there would have been no great turning back to Him. And despite all that we may do, there will be no revival without the Holy Spirit's fire. In the New Testament, fire is often used to symbolize the Holy Spirit. And we are dependent on the work of the Holy Spirit if revival is to come. Jesus said in John 16 that it's the Holy Spirit who will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. And He will guide you into all truth. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. That's the work of revival. And it's, it's the work that only the Holy Spirit can accomplish. Unfortunately, right from the beginning, the church has had problems with getting in the way of the Holy Spirit. Paul felt it necessary to tell the Thessalonians, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. We put out the Spirit's fire when we ignore His, His, His quiet leading in our lives. We, we put out the Spirit's fire when we don't allow Him room to work and move in our lives. We put out the Spirit's fire when we try to do His job ourselves. Elijah prepared he prayed. Then he stood back and let God's fire do its work. We need to do the same. 
We need fire from heaven, starting in our own lives. To bring about revival, we need obedient hearts that are ready to respond. We're often quick to criticize the children of Israel for, for their many instances of turning away from God. But when God's fire consumed the sacrifice, they were ready to respond. They, they fell to the ground and said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Elijah told them to seize the prophets of Baal. And they took them down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them. If revival is to come, we need hearts that are ready to respond. They went on a killing spree. Is that, is that what we're supposed to do? But we've talked recently about this idea of dying to self, of, of killing off the old self. Romans 8, 30, 13 and 14 says, If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. There may be some things in our lives, some attitudes, some, some habits, some activities that need to be put to death. I don't know what God may choose to reveal to you about your life in the next week or so. And neither do you. And it would be pointless to try to guess this morning. But one thing that we can do this morning is to determine how we're going to respond, no matter what God shows us. How are you going to respond if, the, if, if God reveals a spiritual gift in you that, that you really aren't comfortable with? How are you going to respond if He reveals something in your life He's not pleasing with, something you need to get rid of? How are you going to respond if he puts some call on your life to, to some area of service that isn't in your plans? We want God to bring revival in our lives, in our churches, in our nation. We need to have hearts that are ready to respond to what he shows us. We could all use some new life. And God certainly wants to bring us back to the life He intends for us. But it's not just something that happens. It's a confrontation. There will be opposition. It requires sacrifice and devotion. It requires confession and repentance. It requires a, a return to true worship and earnest prayer. And it will only come about with the Holy Spirit's fire. It will only come about in hearts and lives that are obedient and willing to respond. What does God want to revive in us? Will you pray with me? <coughs> Heavenly fire, Father, we look at the world around us we look at ourselves. We look at the church. And there really should be no doubt in our minds. We need revival. We need the fire of the Spirit. We need to be walking more deeply, more closely with you. We need you to be working and moving in our lives, in our church, in our world in a powerful way. We have a good example of, of where we need to be and what we need to do to be in a place where that is happening. I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning and I pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts throughout this week to come. I pray that we would would take this thing seriously, that we would do all that we can to, to be a part and to allow you to work and move in us and through us, Lord. We long for revival. May we be in a place where you can use us to accomplish that. In Jesus' name we pray.
closing meditation is breathe on me, breath of God. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain.